Hello my friends and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video with myself, Amata. I know it's been a little while since you heard from me, I've just been in the background doing the editing for Paul's videos, but I'm here today with lots of gaming news from the uh, last 24 or so hours, as of the 27th of September. Just where even has the year gone, guys? Anyway, we're going to start off today's video with some news regarding Resident Evil 8. Now, for those of you that watched the Capcom special event at TGS 2020 for Resident Evil Village, you will know that it pretty much was a waste of time because they had nothing new to share or hint towards to us for anything, really, with Resident Evil 8. I kind of wondered why they even bothered having an event if they have nothing to show at this time, but whatever, that's a completely different topic. There is one thing that they hinted at, however, and that's that there's a chance, and I do just want to say a chance, that we will see Resident Evil Village on both PS4 and Xbox One. And this came from the game's producer, Tsuyoshi Kanda, and he said, quote, while Resident Evil Village is being developed specifically for next generation consoles and PC, they are looking into delivering the experience on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One as well. Now he did stress that they can't make any promises but they will do their best so whether or not they actually pull this off obviously remains to be seen. They are not promising anything it's just it may it may eventually come to the current generation consoles but who knows they may not be able to get it running in a satisfactory manner and it may never come out it's obviously going to be very dependent. Now I'm pretty disappointed in the Resident Evil event I have to say I was hoping to see a little snippet of gameplay, anything really, but it just, I don't know, it was just... Ugh. Anyway, we did actually get some interesting tidbits about the special edition, edition excuse me, of DMC5. Now obviously this is just an edition for the next generation consoles, so it wasn't anything massive, they didn't spend too long talking about it. But they did share a few little tidbits, for example... Um, they are going to be adding a Virgil mode, and that's going to be released as DLC for the PC and current generation versions. Uh, there is going to be a high frame rate mode, which if you have a 120Hz monitor, you can go up to 120fps. And it is going to include all the deluxe edition content uh, that came out for the original edition of DMC5. So just a few little things uh, for the game. I will say it does look pretty nice with ray tracing. I haven't actually gotten around to playing DMC5 yet, so if PC isn't getting an update with ray tracing, I might just pick it up for the PS5, assuming I can actually get my hands on one. Anyway, we're going to move on to our next topic for today, which is regarding Mass Effect Remastered. Now, for anyone who's been keeping their ear to the ground for all things Mass Effect, you'll know that reports and rumours and all that have been swirling around the internet for some time that we're going to be getting some sort of remastered trilogy for Mass Effect, which would actually be really, really cool, I will say. I put a fair bit of time into Mass Effect 1, but I don't believe I ever played any of the others. Not for any real reason, I just never got around to it, to be honest. There's only so much time in a day. But according to a new update from Gamesbeat journalist Jeff Grubb, According to his information, EA have decided to delay the Mass Effect Remastered Trilogy to early 2021. And apparently this is just due to them needing more time to enhance the very first game, which of course is quite old now. Uh, it came out in 2007, so that obviously needs much more work and improvements than, say, Mass Effect 3 in terms of graphics and obviously gameplay. But he did have some better news. He went on to say that when the pack eventually releases, it will include all the single-player DLCs for the games, uh, but no multiplayer, which obviously was a thing for Mass Effect 3. Now, obviously, EA has still not made an official reveal for Mass Effect Legendary Edition, but we're pretty, we're pretty sure that it is a thing at this point. It's been rumoured for such a long time, and there also was that retailer listing uh, last week, I believe. But obviously EA are hesitant to announce it, given that it's not going to be out until early 2021. They obviously want to show it when it's more complete and polished and show it off in its full glory. Now we're going to move on to a very heavy Xbox segment to round off the video. Um, the first of which is some comments from the Bethesda's original founder. So as everyone ever knows at this point, Microsoft made a huge move and bought ZeniMax, which of course includes Bethesda, which in itself includes, you know, things like id Software and Arcane and Tango Gameworks and tons of other stuff, so games like 
Dishonored, Elder Scrolls, Doom, Prey, could go on and on and on. But we have some very interesting comments from the original founder of Bethesda, the American software developer Christopher Weaver, and he's commented on the sale of his former company to Microsoft. And this was an interview with Inverse earlier this week, and of course you can find that linked in the description alongside this video, alongside everything else I've used as a source today, of course, as usual. Now, he also said that, well he said, I should say, sorry, it was a quote, extremely interesting acquisition on the part of both groups. And he went on to say, quote, Microsoft deepens their bench instantly with one of the most experienced companies in entertainment software during a time when video game sales are at an all-time high. And Bethesda gets the benefit of creating their, sorry, concentrating their creative firepower on software that feeds the Microsoft pipelines, a good prospective marriage of interest with a large domestic public partner. Now obviously a lot of people have been wondering about the impact this will make on the PlayStation 5. Are we going to see pure exclusive, timed exclusives, what exactly is going on there? Now obviously he didn't have any specifics to share given that he no longer works at the company, but he said, quote, I do not think it's any accident this announcement occurred so close to Sony's PS5 announcement. There are only a limited number of proven creators of AAA. What Microsoft owns, Sony cannot get. There are many economies of sale that consolidation between the right partners has the capacity to provide, but the ultimate test will be evidenced by the quality of products produced over time. Ultimately though, he believes that us as the end users, the gamers, will be the real winners of this deal, which again costs Microsoft a pretty penny, $7.5 billion. Not exactly something you're going to find in your back pocket as a surprise one day. He said, quote, the acquisition of Bungie acted as an important trigger for the success of the early Xbox. Depending on how soon Bethesda can prime the Microsoft pipeline, I suspect Microsoft is looking at their playbook and looking to repeat one of its best moves. If the strategy works, it will be a brilliant counter move against Sony. Users from around the world will be the ultimate beneficiaries of this deal. I wish them well. Of course, time will only tell what fruit this particular purchase ends up, well, sprouting from this. But even leaving aside the future of games like The Elder Scrolls 6, Starfield, any future Doom games, any future Prey games, of course, the future games from Arcane and so on, there's obviously a ton of stuff that Microsoft can do with, with all of these companies that they now have under their wing. I'm really curious to see the new IP, the new ideas that come out of this, as well as the staples in long-running franchises such as Doom, Fallout, Skyrim, and so on. Moving on, however, to some comments from Phil Spencer himself regarding the future of Xbox. So these comments came from Phil Spencer following the launch of their cloud gaming service and this was an interview with Yahoo Finance and basically they asked him whether or not this investment in cloud gaming could see the Xbox Series X generation become the last or one of the last for Xbox and he said that they are quote unquote absolutely planning for more hardware that being console hardware sorry he went on to say, quote, we're about putting the player at the center. It's not about the device in the middle anymore. You'll see that in every other form of media. My TV is with me wherever I go. My music is with me wherever I go. I'm in control of the experience and I think gaming is going through that same transformation, which, has, which is why, as you say, if you're a Game Pass subscriber, you can now play your great games on your Xbox console, on your PC, or now on Android phone via streaming. Now I'm sure Microsoft is very very aware that streaming has yet to really take off just because it's very hit and miss with the internet. Like some places have amazing internet. I'm actually pretty lucky in the area I live in now. The internet here is pretty good. I've yet to really have any issues touch wet. <laughs> but obviously not everyone is so lucky. And especially in some places in America you only have a choice of like one or two providers and if that provider decides to just go down or have bad speeds well sucks to be you basically so obviously until that issue is solved I don't think we're really going to see cloud gaming really take over so hardware isn't going anywhere anytime soon but obviously this really plays into Microsoft's strategy that they've had this whole time uh, especially with this generation they're really just trying to get you in that ecosystem I've said like a billion times at this point they want you on Game Pass they want you on Xbox they want you on PC they don't care as long as you're in the Xbox ecosystem so that would obviously make sense to not let hard go any hardware excuse me go anywhere at least not for the foreseeable future 
So, let's move on to our final comments from Phil, which is regarding the success of the console in Japan. So Phil and the other guys over at Xbox have not exactly made it a secret that they want to improve how the Xbox does in Japan with the Xbox Series X and S. It's not exactly a secret that Xbox has historically done pretty poorly in the Japanese market, especially when you compare it to how well consoles like the PS4 and the Nintendo Switch have done in the country. It's just not a brand that has much weight in Japan. And obviously they've had their sights set on changing that by providing games and content that Japanese gamers are actually interested in, working closely with Japanese developers and so on. Now, in case you weren't aware, when the pre-orders went live for the consoles at midnight Japan time, retailers including ones like Amazon Japan and Microsoft's official Japanese store, as well as other um, companies like Yadobashi and so on, quickly sold out of the allocation for both the Xbox Series X and S. Now obviously they probably didn't have a huge amount of units given how poorly the Xbox has done in the country in the past, but this is still a promising start and Phil Spencer spoke on this to Famitsu and this was helpfully translated by a VideoGamesChronicle.com contributor by the name of Robert Sefazon. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. And Phil went on to say, quote, It humbles me to consider how well the Xbox Series X and S has been welcomed by Japanese fans. With the goals we're working towards for the Xbox Series X and S, this is the only, only the first step in a much longer marathon, but I'm very happy to know how much everyone is expecting from us, and it motivates us more when pre-orders pre sell out. We absolutely plan to ship even more consoles in the future. However, before and after launch, demand generally exceeds supply. Moving forward, we'd like to be able to meet demand within a few months after launch, particularly in the Japanese market. We are thinking of the future development based on a long-term outlook. Obviously, having success in a market that you've typically had success in is all about getting the the sweet spot right with availability. You don't want to have no consoles available, so everyone just goes, ah, screw it, I'll just buy whatever console I choose instead. But you also don't want so many that they've got like boxes and boxes of them sitting at the Amazon Japan warehouse or whatever. So... It's going to be interesting to see whether or not they are able to make significant progress in the Japanese market. I don't think we're really going to see them you know, overtake Nintendo or anything like that anytime soon, but I feel like a, a big step forward improvements and a more stable foothold and more of a share of the market in Japan would obviously be an improvement over what we've seen historically uh, for Xbox in the country. Anyway, that is me done for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe. It does help out a great deal. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.